You know, when I was a kid, uh, we used to dare each other, my brother and I, to lick a nine-volt battery. I don't know if you've ever tried that or not. I highly recommend it. Everybody needs to do that at least once. Because for me, that's what the Holy Spirit is. I just feel it buzzing through my body. When you touch your tongue to those two terminals, and it lights you up in a, in a very real way. But the Holy Spirit came, and it gives us life. It gives us a connection with God that no one else in human history has ever had. Do you realize that? Do you realize that? You got a holy and living God dwelling and living inside you. And we must train our brains, our bodies, our minds, the practices of our hands, the meditations of our hearts to align with his word and to align with the Holy Spirit because he is here to lead us and to guide us until the day we die. And so I encourage each and every one of you to go home and lick a nine-volt battery and let that be an object lesson for what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. Those little taps on the shoulders when he asks you to pray for somebody or to close the gap within our church and introduce yourself to somebody new. We all look fine on the outside, but on the inside, the Holy Spirit sees our need. And God the Father is not going to come down. Jesus isn't coming back down to help meet that need. He has put the Holy Spirit in each and every one of us to go and meet those needs of his children. And so at the very least, if you can just be obedient for when God taps you on the shoulder and puts somebody on your heart, on your mind, pray for them, reach out, text message, see how they're doing. And in doing so, in being obedient, find out, maybe ask just one question or make one statement. The Holy Spirit puts you on my mind. Was there a reason for that? See if that nine-volt battery doesn't get you all lit up with their answer. Oh my gosh, I needed that right now. You're going to hear things like that. Okay, but today's psalm, we're looking at Psalm 133. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Psalm 133. I want you to have your finger there because after my prayer, we're going to go right into reading it. And I'm going to pray for us now that the Holy Spirit will do exactly that. Use this psalm to speak to us. On this Back to Church Sunday, with our focus being unity, to be united under one God, one faith, one baptism, one Holy Spirit. Father God, we come before you and we confess who you are in our lives as the author and finisher of our faith. You are our Savior. You are our King. You are the one who is, as that song said, we're going to give you everything that you turn the bad things into our lives into beautiful things, that when we see a dead end, you see a way through. And so, Father, we want to experience all that you have for us. And, Father, you work first on the inside. You're always after the heart. And once you capture our heart, Lord, it flows through our hands, through the words of our mouth. And we want to be Christ's ambassadors. We want to be pleasing in your sight. We want you to look at us and say, that's my son, that's my daughter. Father, we do this, we want to serve you not as a means to gaining salvation, that's done through Christ Jesus. But Father, if we really embrace the full magnitude of your grace, it should compel us to be looking outward and to others. And Father, we want to be a healing balm. We want to be that person who reaches out and just says, hey, I was thinking about you today. I was praying for you today. Is there something going on? And so, Lord, help us, each one. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we read this passage of Scripture. It is only three verses, so you won't be standing very long. But out of reverence for our Lord and this holy word of God, Psalm 133, it reads, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. There's an exclamation point. Let me read that again. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Exclamation point. It's just like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, 
down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. The reading of God's word. You may be seated. So this is Back to Church Sunday. And in studying this passage, I see the word unity in there, and I can see why Pastor Lou uh, has, was drawn to this, and the more I study it, the more I can see why this is a very appropriate passage of Scripture. So I'm going to give you a little bit of context as far as this, uh, this psalm and where it comes, and how it's, uh, it's, its spot in the Bible is on purpose. You see, these, in your Bible may say this, if you have your Scriptures with you, and it says, a psalm of ascent uh, going up, a psalm of ascent. And what does this mean? And so as you begin to study over this passage, you'll begin to learn that there are actually 15 psalms of ascent. This is number 14. And that's significant. And where it's significant is these psalms would have been read and sung to each other as people journeyed to Jerusalem. There were three festivals that all Jewish males, and I'm sure all the families would be welcome, But they were mandated, commanded by God, that all Jewish males were to travel to where the Ark of the Covenant was. When the Ark was gone, they would travel to the temple in Jerusalem. They'd make these pilgrimage journeys three times a year. And just very quickly, the first one would be Passover. This would be in springtime. We celebrate Easter around that time frame. Uh, The second is Pentecost. Uh, What we celebrate was the giving of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. We see that in Acts. And then the Feast of Tabernacles. That was a Jewish tradition where they lived outside of their homes and they lived in tents and and temporary dwellings. Uh, It is at the Feast of Tabernacles for the significance for Christianity. That's where Jesus comes out and reveals that he is Messiah. That's where he comes out and makes the statements like, I am light of the world. Uh, And also refers to uh, his second coming where in Revelation we see where Jesus comes back and will tabernacle or live amongst his people. So there's significance even for us in these three different pilgrimage journeys that Jewish people would take. Well, as they would journey, they would sing these psalms. And when you read through them from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134, you can pick up on some themes. And the theme that we get to in this 14th Psalm is one of unity. Now, you've got to put it in context a little bit more because their life was busy just like your life is busy. We all have things going on. But for three times out of the year, you laid down what you were doing with your life and you began to travel by any means necessary, donkey, camel, on foot, and they would head to the temple to celebrate these festivals. And as the journey began, you know, it's kind of from outward and as you move inward, this 14th psalm, this Psalm 133, most uh, commentaries, they say that it would have been sung together collectively at the steps leading up to the temple. So you would go there and you would recite this psalm, this psalm of unity. And I was trying to think, like, what is this like for us today? What, what, what is something that we can kind of latch onto? Because as I began to dig into this passage, I, I began to see that there was an energy that would start to grow and develop, right? Because can you imagine they're traveling from different parts of, of Israel and they're excited. They're excited to see different people. I'm excited to see Roger or, you know, I'm excited to see Brian and Aaron and, and, and different people. And they're coming from all around and there'd be this excitement that would start to build. And so I thought, what in our context do we, do we have that kind of excitement? And I did think of something. College football tailgating. (laughs) People drive from all over the state to go back to their place, right? And, and, And they do. There's solidarity. They dress in the uniforms. They share the colors. They have all of these these common phrases and things that they would chant and say, and they all got a fight song. And they come to and there's an energy there, isn't there? That you can't really point to it and say, here it is, there it is, but you feel it. But you feel it. And that is what this psalm is getting at. And so for us on Back to Church Sunday, this is what we're looking to do. We, we have this, but I want to celebrate. This is the, the we kind of have the calendar church year, if you will. It kind of follows the school year. And Back to Church Sunday, we got Bible studies starting back up. We got the PGM, excited about you and your family and launching the, with our youth. 
There's a lot of excitement. There's a buzz. If you were here on Wednesday, you maybe saw it. Could you feel it? Could you feel it? All sitting together, sharing a meal. People who maybe not have seen each other for a while. Connecting. Uh, Pastor Bill, Colonel, asking us to connect on a level where if you see someone that maybe you don't recognize, their face is new. I've met some new people today. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. We have a family that is very united, but we're coming off a time where we've been, in, we've been in some isolation, folks, over the last year, and it's taken its effect on us. And I'd like to say that churches are frontline workers. We listened to Dr. Henry Cloud at the Global Leadership Summit this last August, and he said something that I thought was really profound. He just made a statement in the midst of his speech, and it stuck with me. My percentages might be a little off on this first one, but he said this, prior to COVID, Around 12 to 15 percent, I can't remember exactly what he said, 12 to 15 percent of people were diagnosed with some sort of mental health issue that required help. He says, coming out of COVID, when he looks and he's meeting with the people, he says 40 percent of people have diagnosable mental health things going on in their lives. We were not meant to live in isolation. We were meant to come together. And I don't know about you, but I need it. The strength I get from worshiping the Lord today, man, that's going to carry me straight on through the week. I'm going to be humming those songs. And when I think of his word and I think of what God is doing in each one of our lives, I want us to be this aroma. Let's go back to our passage. And I'm just going to make a couple light comments, then turn it over to Lou. I want to read again. It says, we read first two verses, Psalm 133, verse 1 and 2. It says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Remember, they've gathered together. They're having that energy, that buzz, that aroma of unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. And when I first read this, I thought, What a mess. How am I going to clean all that up? Water's not going to help. It just keeps running off all that oil. Oil in the scripture was meant to be a symbol of something that's been anointed as holy and set apart. God's people, as we come together, essentially we're being anointed. We're anointed with the Holy Spirit who's living in us, that unites us. And it should give a fragrant aroma. As Christians, we are command, only given one command by Jesus. He says, the whole world will know you're my disciples by how you love one another. I think he only gave us one because he knew that one would be hard enough to follow. And there are many things for us believers that we can allow to cause division in our lives. And I think by doing so, we diminish the power of the gospel. If we're looking for argument, if we're trying to be right, we diminish the power of the gospel. If anyone walked on this world that could have said, I told you so, and really flexed on being right all the time, it was Jesus. And he doesn't. He came to serve. He was ridiculed, beaten, scorned. He was maligned. He had a lot of false news spread about him. But you see him coming to serve, not to get in arguments. And so I look at it and I just say, Lord, I don't want to argue really with anyone, but especially with my brothers and sisters in Christ, because then I'm not fulfilling that commandment that you gave us, to love one another. And I'll leave you with Jesus' prayer. In John chapter 17, he is praying to his disciples before he ascends to heaven. And so he starts off, my prayer is not for them alone. He's talking about, he's praying to his father, by the way. His disciples are listening. My prayer is not for them alone. He's talking about his immediate disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's you and me. And what does he pray? That all of them may be one. May all of them be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. See, that's that Christian testimony. The unity that we have as believers allows us to have a testimony that Jesus is who he says he is. When I allow Jesus and his authority in my life to put my will here and his will here, 
My hope is that the gospel of Christ shines through. Verse 22, he says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them, you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and that I have loved them even as you have loved me. Folks, let's love one another. We may show up to that tailgate party driving different vehicles, dressed slightly different. We come to church driving different vehicles, coming from different places. But there should be an excitement, an aura. We should be excited to see one another, to encourage each other. So I would love, I hope my question comes up because we all submitted questions to ask. And mine was pretty simple. And I know some of you will really groove on this. But my question was, would you rather have a lightsaber or a jetpack? You can get some really wild conversations going with that one. <laughs> Lightsaber or jetpack? And maybe we'll have that in the weeks to come, so you can start thinking now. <laughs> but the idea is we want to get connected. We do want to be in each other's lives. I look out there and I know that we have things that we need to address, and we're going to do it through prayer and the authority of Christ Jesus, unified, together. Will you join me in this, this year to come? Engage in a way maybe where you haven't before. Step across the aisle, say hi to a new face. You may have been coming here for years and we get our friends and I, and I get that and that's great. But let's be welcoming. Pastor Lou is going to read a, a comment in a little bit from John Kelvin and it addresses that very issue. And so if you see someone that's maybe a little different or you don't know, go with brotherly and sisterly love, introduce yourself because they came here for a reason. And perhaps by you reaching out, God may reveal it and say it was for this purpose. And maybe you can be praying for them. And by that, we'll be loving one another as the gospel commands us, and we'll be living by that nine-volt battery that buzzes us and keeps us going. Father, thank you for my time. I pray now as Lou comes that he will open the word. Lord, continue to have our hearts and minds open, receptive. We thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Mark. The aroma, the togetherness of the people coming there for that special event, Passover, or whatever the event may have been, the psalm of ascent, good, covered that well, covered that well. And, and, and this is a trinity psalm, the oil, Holy Spirit, poured upon the high priest, Aaron, a symbol of the coming Jesus, the great high priest. And then the final verse that we're going to look at, the blessing from the Father. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all in that psalm, Psalm 133. Great psalm. I, I really like that psalm. And appreciate your thoughts and your comments. Yeah. And being connected to each other, relationship. Boy, was that good this past Wednesday. The picnic mentioned that already, but what you didn't know, what you didn't know is this. Our own Eric Marker over here is the one who installs our underground sprinkling. And he sets the computer. And the computer was set for that area six o'clock and as he's driving in at 5 55 <laughs> he remembers the computer is set so at 5 58 <laughs> it was shut off <laughs> or we would have all been very baptized <laughs> not a bad idea though Second baptism, say, hey. yeah. Connectedness, unity, the aroma, the coming together, all those things are there in Psalm 133. In my concluding minutes, I just want to analyze that word unity a little bit more. That word unity. It certainly means the absence of conflict. And I am thankful that at this point, that is true of our congregation. 
Now, there may be differences of opinion. That's okay. Conflict is different than differences of opinion. Conflict means anger, dispute, hatred, separation, refusal to connect. That's what conflict involves. So we can have differences of opinion. That's okay. We have people in this church who are on the political left, on the political right. We have those who like masks, those who don't like masks, who like vaccinations, who don't like that. You know, it goes on and on. But what God hates is division resulting from conflict. Look at what it says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 6. In Proverbs, chapter 6, we read about six things that God hates. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies. And number seven, what the Lord hates, a person who stirs up conflict in the community. A person who stirs up conflict in the community. So the Lord hates conflict. So certainly part of unity is the absence of conflict. At the same time, that's probably not a complete definition. Let's say, for example, that I, I had a drone that was able to take pictures, and I had that drone fly over the, the masses of people in Times Square in New York City that were crossing the street. So the light turns green, and they all cross this way. Then the light turns red from that way, and it turns green the other way, and then all, all, all those people cross the other way. Flocks of people. And let's just say that there's no conflict within those groups of people crossing the street. No conflict. Nobody's fighting. Nobody's arguing. They're just simply crossing the street. And I said, there is a great example of unity. You'd say, well, now wait a minute. Or, or for example, if we had the beach, Holland Beach or Grand Haven Beach, and there's, there's a thousand people with blank. Let's say that nobody is there in couples or in families, but just individuals. A thousand individual blankets, a thousand individual piece, people, and the drone takes a picture of them, and I say, look, no conflict, and there isn't. Nobody's fighting. This is a great picture of unity. And if I pressed you on it and said, is that true? You might say, yeah, but. It's a yeah, but. Yeah, but. That's not a complete definition or picture of unity. There's something missing. And the thing that would be missing in my definition of unity using one of those pictures is connection. Connection. That's where the real challenge comes in. It's not a huge effort just to sit together in a room or walk up and down hallways and not have conflict. That, that's not really a huge challenge. The challenge comes when we connect. The connection, the connection really is the challenge. So let's take a look at that third verse there, that third verse of Psalm 133, because the first two talk about the oil rowing, uh, flowing down on Aaron's beard, the aroma, the people coming together, all what we heard from Pastor Kirsch. And the, the third, the last verse says that, um, that that unity is like the dew of Hermon. Now, Hermon is a mountain. So it was a plush mountain, a lot of water, and it would produce a lot of dew. The dew of Hermon falling on Mount Zion. This is symbolic now of Jerusalem and the people of God, the church. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. So unity is expressed in terms of dew. Now, dew is different than the big splash of water that comes on the windshield of your car if you're going through the car wash. You know, you have this, this river of water rolling down your windshield. It's not really what dew is like. If you get in your car early in the morning and there's dew on the windshield or there's dew on the grass, 
It's more like thousands, if not millions, of little drops of water that are all interconnected. They're all interconnected. And that dew is very important because it nourishes, it nourishes, and it refreshes. See, in Palestine, during the rainy season, you don't really need dew. But in the dry season, which is about half the year, you need the dew. You need the dew, all of those little droplets of water that are all interconnected, you need that dew to fall on the vegetation so that when the hot sun comes up during the day there in Palestine, the plants will not wither and die because they've been nourished in the morning with the dew. And that's the picture that Jesus draws. So it's not just hundreds of people crossing the street or lying on the beach, but it's hundreds of little droplets that are interconnected. And when they are present, there is nourishing and refreshing. Nourish. So, so I believe that there's four parts to a definition of unity. If we're going to be a unified church, and we are, but if we are, four things. Number one, the group. You need people. You need people. Even those watching, thank you for watching, right? We need people. We need the group. Number two, contact. What he was talking about earlier, seeing each other in the hallway. If you're, if you're visiting today, you come down either hallway, go a little ways down and you come to an area we call Main Street. There we've got coffee and donuts and tables set up so you can sit and eat and drink. Uh, out there is the front lobby, you can stand and talk, sharing with contact, contact. So it's not just the group, it's also contact. And then thirdly, lack of conflict, absence of conflict, that's important. From Proverbs 6, what God hates. So absence, and then number four, Harmony, harmony as we connect. Absence of conflict, but also harmony. John Calvin, John, I read John Calvin's commentary on this passage. And John Calvin says, in, in a quote, he says, life is sapless, like the sap of a tree. He says, life is sapless, unprofitable, and wretched unless sustained by harmony. Harmony is the sap. It's the dew that refreshes and nourishes. But wait a minute. If you looked carefully at that last verse of Psalm 133, it doesn't simply say that harmony, that unity nourishes and refreshes doesn't really say that. It says the Lord refreshes and nourishes when there is harmony. Look at it again. Let's look at it again. It says, and, 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 and the passage refers to it as life. Verse 3, it says, the dew of Hermon falling on Mount Zion. Okay, that's, that's the dew, the refreshing, nourishing, harmony, falling on God's church. For there the Lord bestows the blessing, which is life. The Lord gives it. The harmony doesn't give it. The Lord gives it, but he gives it through and because of the harmony. And so where the church does not have unity and harmony, God is not giving the blessing. Where it does have unity and harmony, God is giving the blessing. John Calvin again, John, who, who many people think is very stuffy, you know, very doctrinal and all of that, which he is sometimes, but here's what he says. John Calvin, John Calvin from the 1500s, his commentary on this passage, he says, God is pleased with concord, that is harmony, unity among his people and thereby showers his blessing on them. Let us walk in brotherly love that we may secure 
Walk in brotherly love so that we may secure the divine blessing. Let us even stretch out our arms to those who are different than we are, bidding them to come into the unity of faith. That's what PJ is talking about, right? He's going to be stretching out his arms to the kids, you guys. Because as we have unity among our youth, God will bless our youth. As we have unity in the congregation, unity, four things again. Don't want you to forget them. The group, okay? All of the droplets, all of the people. Number two, number two, connection, connection. Got to talk to each other in the hallways, in Main Street, outside. Number three, lack of conflict. Can differ, we can differ, but lack of conflict. And number four, number four, harmony. And then when we have that, God says, okay, I'm going to bless them. I'm going to bless them. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in Psalm 133. He says, I will bless them. Would you stand? And because we are a unified church, we're a group that connects without conflict and there is harmony. Therefore, God will be with you and me. He will bless you. His face will shine on you. Shine on you. Don't let anybody pass in the hallway today without at least saying hi. And if it's, if it's a staff member, step in front of them. Don't let them get past. Give you peace. He really will. Forevermore. And that's life. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Good morning.